event was advertised as a difficult one, at least physically, and had requirements such as being able to do an integration on your own without playing the victim or requiring any assistance. <laughs> and having done a bit of work with yourself, either charging mantras or doing a lot of spiritual practice, any of it was good enough. We're made of a mass of consciousness, potentials agglomerated. Most of us have studied that through observation, that we have masses of emotion, that is, these emotions can be in the flesh, they're in the mind, and that the soul has something flavorful that could be emotions at a very higher level, causality, like waves of karma, very subtle and soft, but still have a flavor. And we're made of that mass of consciousness, so when we want to accelerate, sublimate, or amplify the amount of convection in our consciousness, so feel higher, feel better, have more supernatural experiences, well, we are facing usually a, a natural reality, inertia and velocity. Inertia, these potentials of consciousness inside us have a certain mass. You know when you feel emotionally heavy? When we uh, have a seminar, we feel super light and super intense, and everything is easy, integration goes like that, and then after a while it's heavier, it's slower. Simply because there's a density to our emotions, to our thoughts, to our energy, our chi, and there's inertia. It's like any other thing. There's, uh, it obeys the mechanic of fluids. So there's it's not necessarily affected by gravity, but we can imagine that something similar to gravity is affecting every plane. That slows down. Okay, the power separation caused various fields of energy. As much as gravity attracts us to the Earth and makes us stand still in a relative way, because the Earth is still moving along. But in a relative position to the Earth, we're kind of immobile. And inertia is there. That energy is drawn away. If you, if you push something in a direction, eventually it slows down and down and down because that energy is lost to that field that the Earth is producing, gravity. It keeps us. And the friction of us as a potential on the surface of the Earth or the floor slows us down. So this attraction field that we have at the physical level, there's something similar everywhere. Okay, so there's, there's a field of energy that pulls down every plane to densify at every other plane. So for our thoughts to become emotion, for emotions to become energy, for the energy to become physicality. Okay. So in the same way that there's gravity in the physical realm that we can measure, there's the attractor field. Okay. And the attractor field is everything attracts everything. That is a reality that appeared at the second plane of creation because Vishnu loves everything. Vishnu is in love. So the universe is in love. And that love is what attracts. Okay. So that attraction field slows down and densifies everything constantly. Which makes us become heavy if we don't spend spend energy. Okay. As we spend energy, we keep ourselves moving and then we sublimate. So when we do a lot of spiritual practice, we're spending energy as much as refilling, as much as we are replenishing, we're, we're acting, we're active, we're moving. So we're deploying a form of effort that releases us from that inertia and brings us active again. So, of course, if we're a lot of people in a seminar, the energy goes high. Because we're a lot of people in a synergy. And collectively, we do that. Sometimes we give a lot of credit to the master. The power of the master is his wisdom. His ability to tell you, do this, do that. And then we have results. Of course, the master has a certain level of power, but never as powerful as 
the one that you all have collectively. Okay? Because you're all powerful beings. You're all divine in nature. And you each have your own discovery of those realities to do. So, I would say that my power during these two weeks and a few days is to inspire you the possibilities, and then you have your own work to do. You need to do it yourself. Inertia and velocity is something that is simple for you to understand because we live it in the physical reality a lot. At the energy level, the vital level, it's the same. At the emotional or mental level, it's the same. So we can imagine it's the same also for wisdom, for causality, and for consciousness. Okay. This attractor field is every potential is attracted to every potential in its field of attraction. Okay. So there are stars in this universe that are not attracted to our sun because they're way too far. <laughs> but there are planets in our solar system that are attracted to our sun because they're close enough. So there's a question of proximity. So whatever you've learned in physics in a way can be applied also to, to the laws that govern every other planet. You need to, to refine your thinking to adapt the level of density to those levels of consciousness, emotional, mental, and so on. Okay. Considering that we're a mass of potential, we have inertia and we're dense. Even if we do spiritual technique, we have a certain level of density. And if we stop doing spiritual technique, we go down, our energy go down. And eventually, doing an integration becomes harder. And accepting that we have an integration to do becomes harder. Pride kicks in. Ah, we don't feel like integrating. And then accepting that something is preventing us from doing integration, or even admitting that we're getting dense, becomes harder. Because we don't want to get dense. We don't want to accept that densification process. Okay, so we're going to explain in a way that I've explained a few times lately and I find it to be inspiring. First, we're going to explain that there's nothing evil in that. Okay. As everything was created from vacuity, so the big cloud of nowhere near what it is, Call it the sublime origin, the zero, the vacuity, the nothing. From that came consciousness. So whatever you want to use as a metaphor on how from vacuity everything came and all potentials were manifested. It densified. Okay. It came out. And it densified to... Usually I teach by experiences, but there's a few experiences you need to go and get yourself. I can't just triggered like that through philosophy, okay? Uh, there's, there's a limit to the amount of agility we can have as teachers to inspire states of being that require a lot of work on yourself to discover. So I'm just going to ask you to trust me on that one, and hopefully you lived it at one point. Great experiences of love came out of this, okay? <laughs> just trust me or not, okay? But great love came out. And the desire to love is extremely present in whatever came out of equity. And love makes us want to get together. Do we agree that love, be it friendship, lover, family, any kind of love really makes us closer? Okay. Well, love is that energy that wants to get together. Okay. And this is what came out. Everything came out as a great explosion of, of everything, very high intense potential, filled with love. And love made all those sublime particles to come together and start to densify and make layers. Okay, a lot of those layers. I, could, I should draw 10 there if we want to do a metaphor with the planes, okay? So as love makes atoms stick together, and then those atoms stick together as molecules. And then more complex things. 
love took consciousness and made it stick together and densified. And what happened is as love keeps us together, it also densifies us to, makes us, to make us heavier. Okay? So love is what causes gravity and the attraction field. Primordial love makes everything want to stick together. And that is a strong pull. God wants to love his creation. And that love is also at the origin of separation and densification. So there's nothing evil in, in separation. It's made of love. Okay. It's what makes everything stick together and become more dense. Do you understand that? Mm-hmm. But once particles of love get together, it vibrates. It creates a shock and does a vibration field. Um, a bit like sound. You, sound is nothing. Sound does not technically exist. <laughs> sound is not something that exists. Air exists, if we want. Okay, let's not go into what exists or not. Okay, we need to, or else it's impossible to teach. So let's use words, <laughs> and none of them are right. Okay, <laughs> sound is waves. Waves don't exist, but waves affect us. It's like causality is a wave, but it's made of nothing. Okay, just consciousness exists if we want to. In the same way that a wave on a river does not exist. When you see a wave on a lake or a sea, it does not exist. A wave is not air, it's not water. A wave is a form, is a shape of the contact of two other things. So, the wave, of the, the shock wave of particles of love getting together goes boom. That is joy. It's, joy is a radiance. Okay? So the experience of joy comes out of that love that gets together. Right? So as love comes in, joy go, is expressed and goes out. Okay? And that densifies us. Until we reach a point of balance. Let's say on, on this layer, this is a point of balance. The physical plane. Okay, this will be the physical plane. Higher than the physical plane. Take a deep breath. It seems to be technical. I know, make an effort to pay attention. Once this is understood, everything else will fall into place. There is more joy in the experience of love than suffering the higher we are. But the denser we get, the less joy there is of every experience of love. Okay? Because we're getting more and more dense, the level of existence where we are is denser, so that joy field doesn't go as far. At an emotional or mental level, joy goes very far. At a physical level, it's pretty much limited in your body, like an orgasm. It's, it's very local. So the denser you are, the less the radiation of joy goes further, and the less powerful it is. Okay? So the more love gets together, and the denser we are, the less joy results out of it. Okay. Because of the density. Eventually we reach a point that there's an equivalent amount of suffering and joy from getting love. So we're humans at the physical plane, and we want to be loved. Love is what we want to come in, and joy is what comes out is what we give to the others. Okay, we don't care about giving love, we care about obtaining it. So what happens when we have densified through the process of getting love, and we reach a physical point that barely no joy comes out anymore, and we still want to be loved, and we still want love to come in, we go lower than the physical plane into hell. We keep densifying. Because we reach a point of balance And this is why physicality is the point of balance between heaven and hell. The physical plane is where the amount of joy and suffering is balanced, is equal. Before we reach a physical plane, beings or entities or ourselves, before we reach that point, it's more fun to have love than the suffering. So we we want more. So that's why we keep going down. But we reach this point where we're in balance. And 
getting love will start to deliver more suffering than happiness. Because we just keep lowering and lowering and lowering. Do you understand that one? Okay. So we are made from this power of love to get everything together, which caused them to exist in form, which made it to exist in a way that we can experience it. It gave it permanence. It allowed it to persist. And then time started to exist. Time does not really exist, but it's a reference of something that stays there, that is not destroyed immediately. Okay? So that density allowed creation. Love allowed creation. And we are made of that love, and we're made of the original impulse, get more love. So we still do that. And at one point, we're here, and we just want love to come in and come in and come in. And we don't even care about the joy that comes out anymore. It's all about getting more love. And then we pack up more suffering because we keep lowering our emotions below the natural level. Do you understand that? So how do we reverse that process? Because as long as, long as there's densification, there's, there's love that comes down. Let's write love in blue. I will need a new blue pen that really writes good eventually. So there's love that densifies a creation, and that vibration causes a radiance of joy to, to flow and convect. And then you have a convection of love is the central channel that densifies. Okay? Well, actually, if you take if you take uh, the principles of convection in the physical plane, it's the hot part that go in the center and the cold on the sides that go down. Okay? But that's just because we're heating a pot and the cold is touching the side. Okay? But here is the cooling stream. What cools and slows down is that power of love that comes down. And joy is the radiance that goes around in the universe. All right? So what's the solution to stop suffering emotionally? Okay, that's a very simple thing. Stop getting more love and give it. That's the solution. Instead of just wanting to pack love in, love me, love me, give me attention, take care of me, so everything comes in, and then you just keep densifying, densifying, and suffering. Reverse the process by pouring your love out. And joy will come. Joy is what will you, you'll receive from that. But that takes a conscious decision because you're made, everything inside you is made of a wanting that love inside and then radiate the joy. You know, the joy is to say thank you once you were loved. It's to, it's to um, share with others that love. You say you share the love, but you still want it for yourself and you radiate the joy, okay? To reverse the densification process and re-elevate your energy, you need to let go of all that love that made you dense. It's simple, huh? it's like laws of physics. So, give the love back. Just give the love back. And that density will be freed from you. Give the love back, just love. Be caring more about the love that you give for the others to feel that love. And then don't control how joy comes. Hey, I love you, but you need to give me some joy. That's not convection. That's transaction. <laughs> convection is you give love. It will produce a stream. And from other sources around you, joy will naturally come. But you don't get to decide. You have to let go of the, of the control. So does that metaphor make sense? Do you understand that? To make your mind holy, you care about loving instead of getting that love. Now, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a nice little parable or teaching. It's like philosophy, but to actually apply it <laughs> is another situation. Because to apply that requires you to defeat your main program, your natural impulse. You were made of of a consciousness, love me. Everything wants to be loved. That's what pulls everyone together. To deliver that love is an art. It takes some observation, some recognition of that 
creation impulse, the understanding of the density that came from the love, and then the letting go of that love. To let go of receiving love is the hardest part. The goal is not to never be loved again, because that would be unwise. That would be ceasing to exist. The goal is to reach balance <coughs> on giving love as much as the love that you receive. So you find a balance. So you stay in the middle way. All right? That's cool. We're made of potentials. These potentials are heavy because of that inertia. But there's also another wonderful law of physics that benefit us is velocity. It's just getting started that is hard. <laughs> Once you start it, it's like uh, going to the gym. Man. <laughs> going to the gym, the, five, the first minute of packing your bag to go to the gym is hard. Once you're, you start it, it's, it's good. You're good. You're just going to the gym. <laughs> so doing spiritual practice is the same thing. So in the boot camp, it's super easy to do practice. There's tons of people doing it. We 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 broke the the ice. Today is the ice breaking. Today is when we will realize that density that usually makes us individual, separated, and distant. Good enough. Please breathe and observe that. Consider the behaviors that we have as human that consist in receiving as much as we can while spending the less as possible. Like if joy was a currency and for every love that you get, you need to give joy back. So we try to give back as little as we can. You know, good business. The attractor field. Please contemplate what we just learned. We're made of a natural impulse to want love for ourselves as much as possible. That densifies to a point where there's no more joy that comes from it. There's just more suffering. We just don't know. It's a natural process. We just want more. We've always done it. Just keep going. To be freed from that densification process... Giving that love, meaning accepting not to receive it, is what lightens our heart. Now, what are the qualities required, or the virtues required, maybe, to do such a thing? Let's start with humility. Patience. <laughs> let's, let's start with patience. <laughs> yeah. It requires some humility and some patience to accept the reversal process. That process where we just want the love in and then for that love to go back and to let go of what we receive in life. And then joy will come from every direction through convection. Then you'll be supported by this new power that you have. The power to love. We're going to have a lot of philosophical contemplations and you will be responsible of feeling the emotional and the mental aspects of those on your own. Okay. You can imagine the mourning principles involved in letting go of being loved. Uh, there's a form of mourning. How do you say mourning <coughs> in Danish? No. Uh, how do you say it in Spanish? No. No, no. You got that? To mourn. Not a specific person. The same way that universal love is not... I love something, like I love myself, I love you. It's there is love. You understand the distinction between primordial love and local experiences of love. When you love something or someone, that love is impermanent. It's temporary. It will go away. When there is love, there is love. It's just there. There's no object of that love, etc. 
accept the experience of it. And you are self-sustained, self-contained in that. It's autonomous. And for, for a long period of time, when we practiced philosophy, what we did in the Madriya was to discover that love for ourselves. Uh, there's a lot of work we do to experience self-love. Now it's time to discover the letting go of that self-love. Love is there anyway. It doesn't need to be limited to our self. Okay, that's still a local experience where you get something out of it. So cultivation of self-love is a very important step. The absence of love is the absence of existing, the absence of reality and experience, which is necessary to evolution and growth. Okay? There's a beauty in creation that it comes from God, and it is a primordial impulse in all things. However, as an ego, wanting that love for ourselves is what limits us from understanding the universal experience of love without any limit to our being. So we have to mourn, eventually, the idea of being loved. If you swim in love, you don't need to be loved locally as an individual, if it's the only thing that is everywhere. Go with that? So can you conceive not being loved? Contemplate that. You can philosophy conceive or accept the possibility in your head <coughs> of maybe not being loved. When all your life, what you tried was to be loved as much as you could. Can you contemplate the idea of not being loved? Once you accept it mentally, then the emotional work can start. But still the body will, has a will of its own. So it will take some time before you physically realize that. The goal is not to be completely deprived of love. That's, that's also egocentric. I'll teach you tomorrow why. The goal is to find balance in the experience of love that flows naturally, to let go of the control. That is frightening because once we let go of being loved, we're never sure that we're going to be loved again. So there's a little kid inside that wonders, well, who's going to love me now? The solution is not to deny yourself love. It's to free yourself of the idea of me. What is me? What you have defined as your identity. You know, when we speak of enlightenment, is the art of freeing yourself from possessions, relationships, and identity. While you still have them, you free yourself from the effect it has on you. So, to free yourself of the me. What is me that so much wants to be loved? As long as there's love, I'm swimming. So, what is that me? That thing that is so limited to a single experience. When you give love, or you let go of the love that you've, you've kept inside as a treasure, you just let it out. So others will have it, of course. Others will take that love. Sometimes you'll say, I'm giving the love, but I choose when and how. You know, I choose who. Of course, you... You want to love those who are giving back joy, who guarantee you a transaction. It takes a lot of courage to just let the, let the love out, and some people will come and rape it. They will just come and, and grab it and take it. And all your patterns of control, well, I'm not going to love you. You're a bad person in my judgment. I'm not going to love you because you're not patient enough for me. Well, maybe you're not patient enough with the person lacking patience. Maybe it's your problem, you know. I'm not going to love you because of this or that. For that philosophical reason, I prefer loving my friends. I prefer loving my family. I prefer giving that love to people who deserve it. And you have you know, knowledge and thinking process of deserving. Deserving then is a form of control of that love. It's not a free flow. and It doesn't come out as a stream agizer. It's very limited with taps you open and you close. Therefore, your convecting joy is like... Ah, ah. You know, it, it also comes in just little bursts, the convecting joy that comes to support you. Until you decide to just let it open. You know, I'm not going to love this person because this person, 
uses my money to go buy drugs. I'm going to love the person that goes to school. Well, see, these are forms of control. Of course, at one point, you have a limited resource in terms of money, so you'll choose who you give it to. However, the love itself is not limited. So it's a learning process to learn to just walk as love radiates out of you. And not controlling how it comes out of you and when. Still, you do it legally and wisely, in a way to, that is prudent, not to hurt yourself or others. It is usually a very peaceful and uh, soft experience. Simple, very simple. And that joy comes back also without control, but the universe is there to support you. Okay, so that's an entire mindset to cultivate. The seminar being the introduction to the principles of immortality will invoke uh, one phrase in the Tao Te Ching, 7th chapter. After what I just said, Lao Tzu expressed his idea that way. The heavens and the earth are eternal because they don't exist for themselves. Chapter 7 of the Tao Te Ching. The heavens and the earth are eternal because they don't exist for themselves. So this idea of existing for the whole does not mean to be in a state of sacrifice. Sacrifice is also a form of denial that considers you should suffer for someone else to be happy. That is not wise. If everyone should be happy, everyone includes you. Okay? So your beliefs in sacrifice means that you still believe in resisting the way to give love. Let's go back to the heavens and the earth are eternal because they don't exist for themselves. And the way to sublimate yourself and free yourself from density is to let go of the love that created that densification inside you. Does that make sense? A little introduction. It's just an introduction speech on what we're going to do this week. Today we're going to practice philosophical contemplations of that. For example, let's start reevaluating the masks of the ego. I'll give a side note on the mask of the ego. You've been studying it a lot. The mask of the ego is not a fundamental truth of the universe. It's a system. And unlike any system, it is useful until uh, it reaches the point where it's not. Okay? We always talk of fences. You know a fence that blocks your way? You know a fence. You know a fence is like uh, there to limit you. And you're always contemplating fences as something that prevents you from going to the other side. Well, actually, we have a misperception of what a fence is. Knowledge is a fence, and usually a fence is on your side, useful to keep you on a progressive way, so you don't go away in some kind of random forest lost. A fence is what keeps you on the way. Sometimes a fence is what prevents you from falling into a cliff and die. Fences are so useful that you judge them a lot. So the great majority of fences, therefore the great majority of knowledge, are useful until it's in your way. Then, if your knowledge, what you know, is in your way, then you have to open your fence. You need to change its position. So that means changing the position of your knowledge. That means changing a belief and an understanding. So fences are useful and knowledge is useful. And we use the principles of integration the way we learned it because it produces results. But don't be limited to that. Usually before the fifth Bhumi, that integration principle is very useful. After that, 
you need to be able to simply be conscious and everything is revelation as it is. But then you reach a point where you just don't understand what is revealed, refer to the system. It will help you until it's not useful. But you, you can't limit yourself to that. Okay? So we're going to use that system of integration a lot because it's useful. However, try not to stay stuck with it. It's a system, I'm sure in a few hundred years some people will find it inaccurate, they'll adapt it to their, their belief, their knowledge, with 216 masks of the ego, because 22 is so lame and limited. Okay. As much as 3,000 years ago, three masks were useful. More than that was way too complicated. Alright, so let's reevaluate all of this, the giving of love. Pull it up. Just pull it. There's a string that makes sure that this open it up completely so we stop being disturbed. Woohoo! My hair is like. <laughs> I'm going to talk about fear again. Just waiting for the next little thing to disturb us. It's not dramatic. In that idea of letting go of the love that we've compacted inside, let's let's take the first mask of fear. You know, one of the first of the first we learned. There's pride, shame, and fear that we learned at the start. So what is fear? This when this love goes away. What's our fear? We're afraid. We're naturally afraid of love going away. It's a natural thing. Just try to find it. There are thoughts that are very easy in the head that will pop. Yeah, but I've been losing love anyway, so it's okay. You can easily justify by saying, I'm okay with letting the love go. You can, you can say it in your head, and I agree. We can be mentally at peace with that. However, emotionally... There is a fear when that love goes away. Okay. It's not required to go into a profound dramatic integration, but at least to understand and feel. How will I be loved then if the love goes away? Well, step by step can't just let all the love go because it's frightening. But step by step, you can discover that there is still love when it flows out of you. <laughs> it's not the end of your existence. You'll find balance. The goal is not to cease existing by sublimating everything you are. Well, eventually you'll do it. That's, not, that's way after ascension. The goal is to find balance to accept to have more love come out of you than the amount that you take greedily by force from nature. Shame. What's the mask of shame in that idea of letting go of love? Anyone has ideas? Because I, I don't feel like shame is a profound mask triggered by the letting go of love. But I'm sure you can be creative. Like you didn't feel like you didn't deserve it? <sighs> ah, okay, so the deserving. Shame. Not deserving. So... Misunderstanding the letting go. Instead of letting go of the love for the joy that will radiate all over, you're letting it go as it wasn't meant for me. So then shame is that idea of, of giving love because you were not a good target, which is a misunderstanding of what we want. The goal is not to be deprived of what you need. The goal is to, is to accept the true purpose of love. Is to be shared. Good, that was created. Thank you. That was not one of my issues in life, the idea of not deserving love. I took it greedily by pride. Of course I'm loved. <laughs> so do you have this one, pride? The pride goes in conflict with the idea of love flowing out. It's not, it's not the losing of love. You're not losing love when it comes out of you. You simply stop believing it was your property. Can you conceive the idea that the love was your property? 
It will help you understand that pride. Okay. If you put the mask acquire, okay, and the mask uh, uh, over certitude, the over certainty, that love is mine. Okay. If you put these masks there, we just you just take for granted this love is yours. Then you can understand the pride that you built on it. I am loved. And then you, you have this idea, why should I let the love go away? It's mine. So as shame will make you believe that you don't deserve to be loved, in pride you still take it for granted. And what is wonderful with the ego is you can have both contradicting patterns at the same time. Ego doesn't mind. I don't deserve it, but it's mine anyway. Fuck you. <laughs> and that becomes arrogance. <laughs> okay? So, we've considered those denials. The denials will be triggered in that work that you do in accepting the free flow of love. You know, love must flow. But there's many systems inside us that are not in accordance with that flowing love, with that giving back. The letting go. Breathe. Can you feel something inside is reacting to this? Part of it is enjoying it, part of it is not enjoying it. Part of it doesn't care. What is shaking or what is reacting is the surface retention. You know when we're speaking that we're potentials with inertia and we're dense? And as we do observation, as we contemplate some wisdom and feel the emotional, um, the emotional experiences that rise, that, it shakes the surface of our water. The surface retention is shaken. The surface retention is something that tries to hold that density in. And that is what troubles us when it's time to go to the gym and we don't feel like it. When we just want to eat more sugar and, and it's an effort not to take it. You know, there's, there's something reacting to the wiser choices, the wiser action. That control is something that we just shake off. And then that surface retention loses power and velocity starts again. Then the elevation will start again. So... To do some emotional stretching, eh? it's like stretching your muscles just before you go to the gym to make sure that you'll be fine, you won't hurt yourself, and then stretching the muscle after the exercise to keep them flexible. Some emotional stretching like this, these first contemplation we do in any integration period, you integrate alone, it's harder the first minute. Do you agree? There's a lot of pride. I don't want to do that fucking integration. Oh, that feels so good. I want to do it again. No, not again. There's a fighting. There's a conflict. Okay, It's that surface retention. It's just the potentials inside have hardened and are filled with inertia. They don't feel like moving. It's not laziness. It's inertia. So as you move it, it takes a bit more effort and it shakes and it breaks and then it starts to get loose again. So we are doing that that acceleration process. We're reaccelerating the flow of conviction inside. One of the things you really enjoy when we, we gather as a group is that everyone loves everyone. So that philosophy of letting the love flow is something that we've been doing a lot. Now we explain it. Okay. For the newbies, we don't explain that. We just explain to them the basics of stopping being suicidal. Okay. Now we're not at this point. Yeah. <laughs> during, during this boot camp, we're going to have lots of fun of all the stuff rising from the body. You'll see everything that was compacted there. You know, we think that we're free of everything, but actually the, the, the curse of ignorance is we completely ignore what we don't know yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess it's a question of patience. If there's nothing else to resolve, it simply won't rise. So let's just keep doing the practice until a long period of time comes without anything rising. So I was doing my Anumi Manvan the other day, a city, the tenth city, contemplating the body as already a divine nature. Most people who learn Anumi Manvan try to bring God in the body, and that is not a wise contemplation because they're forcing 
divine essence into the body, when actually the fact is to realize the body is already divine in essence. Okay? So we contemplate the body as already divine. And whatever reacts to being divine is, rises. And I had a guilt from when I was 22 or 23, 21, I don't know, early, earlier in my life, where I insulted a girl. I just told her to go away. I didn't know I still had it. I, I could have had the memory of someone reminded me the story, but there was an emotion there. There was a regret. Wow. So mentally... And emotionally, I was done with the purification process. But in my body, there was still a regret of pushing away a girl that felt desire for me, that I felt desire for, but I didn't deserve it. I couldn't be with such a beautiful lady. So I, I just told her to just go away. And it was more like, oh, fuck off, instead of please go away. It was a really insulting way. Defeating. You know, the, the, to, to be arrogant, to pretend that I'm better than that. But actually, I was just really weak and not in charge. I was not in control of that situation. And that, that experience, the idea of intimacy or closeness to that woman just scared me off. So, I mean, this is beyond my... my I was not in charge with her. You know, I was, I was going to be weak. It was unacceptable for a powerful... Well... You know, a young man that wants to be all-powerful. So anyway, I rejected her with an insult. And in my body, there was this regret and this hatred. Oh, fuck, what the fuck did I do that? It was stupid, you know. The body didn't care how my mind felt about it. The body just said, it works. It works. Just touch her. It works. She wants it. You want it. Just do it. Now. <laughs> so in my body, there was that. So, wow. Okay, so this week... I was contemplating that, so this potential was there. I'm just, the body was already divine in nature. It was already free-flowing love. It was already ready to, to accept the exchange and how nature is made, but not my mind. And this is the conflict that happened that compacted one of those potentials. It was still, it was still there. It was not big, but it was still there. So you're going to have some of those weird things that you don't remember or forgot. And don't fantasize too much this week. Don't fantasize too much. You know, go into past life and stories and stuff. We want to discover the subtle potential stuck in our body. We want the physical body to accept the principles of immortality, at least expanding the lifespan. And physically embodying a supernatural experience, then, then there's some work to do at this level. First, don't think that God is higher and you need to force it down your body. That is a misunderstanding. That's a, that's a thinking process born of separation. You want to realize the already divine nature of the body. And as it awakens, it will be divine. Go with that. Breathe. Let's go back to the fear. I give an example of how my body felt. It'll take a bit of peace in there to understand, intellectually understand your mind as an idea of what you feel. Your emotion doesn't care about your ideas, it feels. And your body is living another experience that is felt. And it is not the same emotions in, in the four layers, but we, we separate in three. There's a mental emotion, emotional emotions, and physical emotions that combine also the energy emotions in there, the chi. Okay. So if, if you have a thinking process, well, well this is not how it, it's, this is now, what can I say this? I don't think that this is how it happened. You know, this kind of thinking where you want to interpret what you feel, this is not wise. Allow it to rise. Okay, there's a, there's a fear. And then your mind goes into an obsession. Your mind needs to understand its entire story. I need to remember where it came from, to tell myself a story, to justify it. Why is it there? Until I understand why is there emotion in my body, I can't integrate it. 
Well, that's just your mental opinion. As long as you observe it, you're doing integration, and it works. Do you realize that? Sometimes you just have emotions. You don't know where it comes from, what it means. You can't even define which mask. So you still observe, and at one point, it just goes. So the system, like I said, the system is very useful, but if it blocks you, let it go. It's there to accompany you. It's not there to limit you in doing integration just that way. Okay. Like when you learn to drive a bike, you start with the method, but after some point, you try crazy stuff like, look, ma, no hands, and you know, go beyond the rules. <laughs> then hurt yourself. It's so easy to contemplate abandonment in that let it go of love. Huh? Isn't that obvious, the mask of abandonment? If all the love that made me me goes away, who will I be? Well, your identity is made of the love that accumulated. If you let go of all that love, your identity will also let go of its definition. It's wonderful because that fence will open. The identity will keep you safe, but it won't block you. You'll change its position, which is good. You can imagine the abandonment of not knowing who you are until you reach a, a certain point of faith where it doesn't matter if you know who you are. As long as you're there, you're there, so you don't need to understand your existence to keep existing. It's frightening. Okay, so there's an abandonment of letting go of that. Guilt, be creative. Who has an idea of how guilt could rise from the letting go of, uh, of love? There's Aaron's idea of not deserving, but try something else. You know, we can be creative. You wanted to keep it. You didn't want to let it go. It's like, oh, now I'm hurting myself more. Yeah, superficial. Yes. Anyone has ideas? They're complicated. The guilt on how you acquire the love. If you steal something and then someone takes it back, you feel guilty. Okay. So the guilt of how you acquire the love might rise while you let it back out. Did you acquire love by force or manipulation? It happened. Huh? It's a natural animal reflex. This is, it's just a little simple surface review. We're not going to do integration the entire week. Integration will force itself on, upon you with great violence. So we're just getting ready for, for whatever arises. But great revelations of yourself as divine <coughs> will follow up. So that's, it's cool. Okay, so guilt is good. Rejection. That simple. Who will love me now? <laughs> Who will love me now? Do you need to be part of a group so much? Huh? Are you still coming to Magia meeting because you need a family? Or because it's fun? Because it's useful? <coughs> huh? In Mexico, it's a real phenomenon. They call themselves Mahajrians. They don't call themselves Buddhists anymore. They say, we're not Buddhists, we're Mahajrians. Mahriyana. <coughs> I like it. So, well, if it's naturally starting, it means it's time to go. So we're not Buddhists. Okay? We're, Ma we're Mahajrians. <coughs> Even in the new population of planet Mars, we're, we're going to be Mahajrians. <coughs> <laughs> there was a joke I did with people from NASA about, you know, they have a plan to terraform Mars. They're always sending people there. Actually. <coughs> Most of you don't know that there is humans preparing to go to Mars and live there. Okay. Scientists and TV show producers. <laughs> yeah. There's a reality show where 16 people are going to live on Mars. It'll be broadcast on BBC, I think, or something like that. It's crazy. Anyway, so I was thinking there will be Marsians on Mars, which is cool. 
That was a nice word game. So, <laughs> do you need your family? Or do you simply enjoy having it because this is what God gave you now? It's good to have a family. Yeah. Don't reject it. Don't force it. But depending on it is also a limit. Okay. Your biological family, same thing. You know, it's in your blood. I have children. I would kill to save my children. I think I would die to save my children's lives. It's a reflex. It's in, it's in the South. Huh? We want to protect. Contemplating the denials and the emotions in that letting go of love accelerates. It disturbs the surface retention. Do you feel as heavy now that we've looked a bit the surface? You feel that there's less of the resistance to integrate? It's <sighs> good. Now let's imagine that from the letting go of love, joy comes. How can this happen? It's like a magical phenomenon. You have all this love coming out of you, and then you have joy. Do you have the, um, the conception that you have a certain limit of love, and you can't give too much or else you'll be out? Like if love was a battery. Do you have this idea? I mean, I have that much love, I can't give more, or else I'll die. You know? Actually, uh, you know the difference between hydroelectricity and uh, atomic fusion? In atomic fusion and fission, there's so much energy in atoms that a few atoms that break or join delivers a tremendous amount of energy. And it's super small compared to the immensity of hydroelectric dams for the amount of electricity it produces. So if you do fusion of love, if you practice a technique of fusion, like we learned in chanting Om, doing the cauldron, that fusion, when, when joy and love comes back inside into bliss, into a one self-sustained experience of bliss, the amount of energy delivered from that is absolutely extraordinary. And you have infinite resources. And if you spend it all, if you really spend it all, you'll be accomplished by then, way far. So don't even worry about it. But as a human, we, terms, we, we think in the mechanical terms, if I give too much love away, I will miss it. The idea is not, is not to take love rock by rock. It's to go into a state of fusion inside and it will just radiate with power, like nuclear fusion. Cool. So let's mourn being loved, right? Uh, I know some of you hang out with Maria because everyone loves everyone. You love, but because everyone does it, you receive so much. Okay. So it's kind of a, a paradox or ironic to contemplate the idea of letting go of being loved in a, a so reassuring environment where you're certain to get more than what you really need. You know? <laughs> but it's a practice. It's, a, it's like a... Being healthy at the hospital and still being cared for while you don't really need it, okay? So, <laughs> like in a hospital bell in intensive care with no sickness at all and no purpose there, but you still are, okay? So, you're going to be loved a lot, okay? Let's try to contemplate the idea of not existing just for yourself. The morning letting go then in your human life your normal life in general you are the person that loves in general you you know most of the time you are the person that is there caring and loving the others and these people find you awesome and take your love Without hesitation, usually. Mm -hmm. 
So if the great immortals learn how to walk in the desert with no resources, this is what you learn. You learn at the emotional level to live in the desert. The idea of being the one with the resource. The one that radiates. If you radiate power more than the sun itself in the desert, then you're not affected by the heat of the sun. You're affecting the desert yourself. That's how Jesus went to the desert, and he was not affected by the natural laws of the desert. He was affecting the desert himself. He was emanating more of that power than the sun and the hot rocks and the sand. So, okay. so we start with love. The idea of, of being that radiance so much that you're the one affecting nature. So it, it, you don't even need love to come in. You've had enough. Since the origin of your beingness as a soul, you have been compacting love. You have so much compacted love that you have an infinite amount of, of power. That contemplation makes greed obsolete. Your greed is a natural reflex. We just want more and more. Contemplate greed from that point of view. Greed. You know when you work on your ego, greed is very hard to let go. Greed is hard to work with. When you do simple integration. Greed is so present that do integration, greed, you know, it's, it's hard work to let go of greed. Until you find a state where you don't even need to let go of greed. Greed becomes an obsolete process. Until you find that pure state of being, which will take a long time, believe me, because you need to reverse your creation impulse of your core and love. Once you reverse the act of creation, and you on the earth become God the creator, physically at a physical level, you are the creator. And the creator is the thing giving love. It came out from vacuity, from, from the origin, from the Ein of Aor, and then to creation. But now on the physical level, you'll be doing that. So you become what provides creation, the love giving. And then you become God on earth. And then the poisons are obsolete. The idea of defending yourself, hatred, the idea of Fighting for love, any kind of hatred in any way, which is the violence of love. Hatred is love, same thing. Hatred is love to the point where there's much more suffering than joy that comes out of the exchange. Okay, it's just that over-densification. It, it's pulling deeper into the place of hell. Well, if you just give the love, hatred is obsolete. So the poison itself is just carried by the deluge of your love. This little, this few ounces of bad bile that you still have inside you are just washed away by a notion of, of love. A very powerful radiance of your fusion reactor. So when you have so much fusion inside you, you create your own attractor field. So instead of being submitted to the field of attraction, you create your own attractor field. So eventually people are attracted to you because you become an attractor field yourself. You're a creator, you're a god, and everything starts to revolve around you. And people even pray you at one point instead of praying God. But at this point, praying you or God is the same thing. It's a natural process. I never ask anyone to pray me. People started doing it because they felt they received an answer like if they prayed Jesus or anyone else. And it's not something we ask, it's something that happened. You know, in the steps of evolution, you have the Arat, the Pratika Buddha, where, where the Buddhification is irreversible, then you are Buddha. And after that, you have the trainer of man, and eventually you have the world hearted one, or the worthy of praise, the step. Now, you know, because after the Bumis, the ten Bumis, there's many more steps of evolution. There's, there's steps of evolution before the, the Buddha's Bumis, 
there's three of them, the animal, the, 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 the zombie, and then the seeker. And that's why we have another scale. In our tradition, we don't only use the boomies of Sakyamuni, because that was very Brahmanical. Whoever is not evolving, discard them. We, you don't need steps of evolution for them. And whoever gets to Buddha, we don't need to talk about it, because they're autonomous. But we're still progressing, so we need to talk about it. So after the Buddhification of our mind, we reach a step, which is the world honored one. And naturally, people bow to you, respect you. They just, like animals, to their creator. They just naturally start to obey. Okay. And there's, there's the point where they start to pray you. So it happened with Shivagam lately. People just start praying him. And they receive experiences. Well, it's the same energy. They're not praying Shivagam. Shivagam is just another identity that he dissolved. The me. You know, that letting go of yourself. So if you can let go of what made your identity then you're not your identity. So anyone who prays Mahavajra are not praying Mahavajra. It's just a tool. It's a fence. You can be stuck by the idea you have of Mahavajra. You should, you should open that fence. So it remains just a guide along the way. That's it. Not be blocked in the idea of who's the master, who's that. Okay. So the idea of ignorance also becomes obsolete. In, in that outpour of love, the idea of ignorance, the concept, the poison of ignorance is obsolete because the, the poison, the need to know, is also dissolved. The greed of knowledge is one of those fences that causes ignorance. Because you want to know so much that you end up surrounded by all fences of any kind of style. And that causes ignorance. Okay? Too much knowledge. Not enough knowledge, you're stupid. You can't even walk. Too much knowledge... You can't even walk. Just fences everywhere. It's fun to know everything. The idea of knowing everything, that comes in the ninth Bhumi, which is the uh, 13th step, uh, to 12th step of evolution, is the correct intelligence or the good intelligence. When you don't need to learn something to know it, you just need to be introduced to a few principles and everything fits in place. Once you know the rules of the universe, your mindset in place. So then ignorance is just all. All the hard work we do regarding three poisons is essential or else we can't even reach that level of comprehension. However, these poisons will not go away until you reach a state beyond them. And then they are made obsolete. They don't, they don't even have influence anymore. They drop. Until you reach that state, charity is an effort. Charity is something that you have to do one and then another time as individual events until charity is a state of life, a state of being. Forgiveness is something you do sporadically. I forgive you. It's, you know, I forgive that. I can forgive myself. And it's forgiveness with objects of forgiveness. Until you reach that state where forgiveness is a state of being, the, the, the idea of being offended does not even arise. So this is what happens in the reversal of densification, the reversal in the stream of love. To consider yourself as a creator, and that's useful also in a class in the art of creating matter. To be a creator, you must do what the creator does, which is outpour love with no limit. Not to be afraid that you'll miss some. The creator is the first radiance that comes from vacuity, so you become that vacuity. You empty yourself, and then you your radiance of love infinitely. And that requires defining everything that made you so far, because everything you are now is the densification of that love. You want to be God? Do what God does. That understanding on what creates is densification and love is glue <laughs> well that is highly metaphorical because love is, is the, the universal agent is solvein coagula okay. and love and joy are polarized and separated experiences of bliss now we've studied that in many seminars just teaching you what is required to be able to eventually 
feel love and bliss, uh, love and joy at the same time, to stop seeing it as separate experience, and then bliss happens. So we're not going to take a long period of time to reactivate that. We're just going to do it because we've done it in the past and we're used to it. Now that we have shaken the surface restanchion, that we have loosened up our inertia, and it's easier to convert, okay? we're going to contemplate softly there is love. Don't force it, don't prevent it. And each with your level of experience, there is love. Now, we don't need to play strong mind games with you, because this is not a newbie seminar. We're simply going to say, everything is happy. And we'll go to the joy. We can use or not the happy faces. Okay? So you modulate happy. Happy. Just because you can. <laughs> and you feel that there's a radiance in the happiness. There's, there's this, this vibration. And then you contemplate there's love. And love feels more like a wind. It's still metaphorical. Love seems to be something that flows. Love in, in polarized movement, in polarized interaction, love is movement and joy is frequency. So there is love. There is joy. Love. Joy. Love. Joy. If love is experienced by itself and joy is experienced by itself, there's another experience that is love-joy. And it's not love and joy as two separate things. It's one experience, which is love-joy. As a single thing. And the fusion happens. Love-joy is the moment of fusion. And then there is bliss. Where love and joy are not two separated experiences. It's bliss. So we're focusing on love-joy. The point of fusion. Where it's, it's getting back together. And love-joy. The fusion back into bliss. That fusion delivers ultimate power. If you try to be powerful, you're arrogant. All you have to do is focus on that fusion which will deliver whatever resource you need. Love, joy. Love, joy is a cornerstone where separated love and joy goes back to being just one bliss. And bliss does not exist in creation. It's vacuity. Mm -hmm. Bliss is before the radiance of joy. It's before the flow of love. It's before the attractive feel. Bliss is beyond that. Love, joy is a focus, like a returning to the origin. Yeah, let's not use the word return. It's to realize that you are already in the origin. But that's not so hard. Just contemplate it. Love, joy. And you can feel that fusion, like when we do the cauldron technique, when you do a lot of OM. And everything fuses back together. <coughs> when we do fusion technique, if you didn't learn it, whatever technique I'm going to invoke this week, if you didn't learn it, it's okay. Just follow your best, okay? So those who learn it, we have fusion of love, of desire, actually. And we have fusion of power, fusion of love in the heart, fusion of knowledge, fusion of consciousness. That's the five fusion in nature. Then there's a three fusion of self. You know, when we have a system of five, then we use a system of three for the soul, and then all, just all of it. And in the three fusions of soul, we have a fusion of all of our nature, then the fusion of us with everything else, and then the fusion of the universe. Then, absolute fusion, the ninth fusion at the end, the fusion of perfection. When we contemplate love-joy, 
as the fusion of love and joy, the end of separation. It naturally invokes bliss inside. But there's this, this power, this fusion power, which is the ninth fusion of perfection. It's a way to go immediately into that state. Okay. Of course, to practice fusion in every of the nine steps patiently with time will make that experience very rich and deliver the wisdom of that experience. But this is not the class we want right now. Now we want a class on the final fusion of everything. You still live it as an individual, but eventually you won't even live it for yourself. You <coughs> simply admit that there is fusion and there is love, joy and everything. As much as atoms are still combining, as atoms are still splitting, and atoms are still rejoining, there is fusion in everything. <coughs> and love, joy is, is absolute. And the whole of creation is filled with it. Every transaction and every interaction between every component and potential in this universe is having a moment of love joy. They're having a moment of love when they're receiving and joy for what they are emanating. But on the precise point of the joining, bam, you have a bliss right there. But it's so temporary and so short that you can't even distinguish it when it happens. To understand this, this moment is like a lightning. On the precise moment where everything at one point is separated and joins. Bam! That's not love, that's not joy, it's both. There's a love joy, it delivers a rush. And that's why we like to fall in love more than to be in love long term. That falling, that bam! This delivery of power that happens. Interesting, yeah. In every action, there's a moment of eternity, an absolute divine godness that is so small <coughs> that we lose it. So if we contemplate love, joy, where everything in nature is either love or joy, in, in the flow or in the radiance, if you contemplate love, joy, you can identify that small moment of fusion and stay there. And then you're eternal. It's an instantaneous moment of eternity. It's out of time. It doesn't flow, doesn't radiate. It's all encompassing, it still doesn't exist. It's a paradox. It is nothing. And it is conceived as everything. And the power is infinite while it was still empty. It's the secret of vacuity. It's empty and everything comes from it. It's the paradox. So this is the fusion that we're contemplating, love joy. <coughs> it causes a little shock inside, it's very light. But this moment of of revelation, we'll, we'll put a bija in there. We'll express it as the bija, pram. Pram. P-R-A-M. P -R -A -M, pram. Pram is a bija. It contains the idea, the root of prema, the word of love, and ram, which is the, the word of, of pleasure and enjoyment. So pram is both prema, it's about love and joy at the same time in a single bija, pram. Pram is the pram. It's the, that fusion of separation back into, not back into one, back into nothing, which delivers everything. If you fuse back into one, you still have something. You still have an object. When you fuse back into vacuity, into emptiness, then 
that vacuity can deliver an infinite amount of results, which is the fusion, which is the, you know, the reactor. So pra is a simple bija that we contemplate. Pra. Like a city. Just the word itself seems like a blunt thing. You know, okay. But if you philosophically contemplate love joy, if you if you say the words in your language, in your home language, in Danish, Spanish, English, French. En français, j'aime dire joie amour. Peu importe, c'est ridicule. Love joy. Love joy. So we will all stand up. While you say pram in your head, you're not into the pram experience because in the pram experience there's emptiness. You can't be saying a bija to really experience it. So when we contemplate pram, we contemplate that we are preparing ourselves to identify the real moment of pram, which will be a moment of emptiness and totality as an experience. So the moment we will be sitting, when you're about to sit, you're doing something. I am in the action of sitting. And then there's a break moment in time where time ceases. And then the new action starts. I have sat. I'm just there. But the moment, there's a precise moment where time ceases to exist exactly at the end of your action of sitting and when the event of sitting starts. When there's a transition between causality, the karma, or the event, and then the nature. Because the experience of sitting changed nature. It was an action and then became a state. But while you are sitting, you are not in the state sitting. Do you understand that? While you are doing the event sitting, you're not sitting. It's because, it's because you're not that you can do the action. So sitting is the action of preparing yourself to reach that state. And while you are sitting, you're not sitting until you're sitting and then you're not anymore because you're already. Can you grasp this? That you switch from causality to state, to affliction, to being, to being affected by your cause. But exactly on the moment of the switch from one to another, you have a glimpse of a layer of nothing, where you're not either doing the action nor in the state, and in that moment, you are eternal. So try to identify it. That's it. When you successfully touch your moment of eternity and keep it, and you don't care about the actual state that you're now sitting, you just, you've touched that eternity and you just hold on to it. And it invades you. So now, we're going to stand. But as long as we're going to stand, we won't be standing until we actually stand, that we won't be standing anymore, because we will stand. We're not going to do the event. So we're going to switch from karma, fr from movement, to, to stillness, again. So we're, we're going to prepare ourselves with pram. 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 We, we will not be saying the bija when we find the moment of eternity. We're just preparing ourselves. I want to be sensitive to that fusion moment between separated
Phenomenons. Pram. 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 And now stand and touch the moment of eternity between two phenomena. Simply keep the eternal flavor. Sit. And now that the eternity experience could have revealed itself, depends on your ability to see these things, then you support it with the Bijan Pram. So Pram is not the eternity. It's what is the contemplation that eternity can persist in the non-eternal states. Uh, introduction to immortality is an introduction to the, the experience of eternity. There is time while you're doing an action. There's time while you're not doing anything. You're in a state. But there's no time in the precise fraction of transition between any phenomena. And that is very interesting. That is so subtle, that is why we're going to practice the city of anima. The great benefit of the city anima allows you to grasp those infinite moments where even intellectually your mind grasps a nothing between two things. And once you can grab an, an experience of nothing, you just keep it in your mind. You keep in the contemplation of it, and then you have this right. <laughs> it's not obvious, eh? But <laughs> I'm on a laughing trip right now. I've got these rushes of eternity that rise. It's so fun. So when we do non-bread, we'll learn non-bread again. Okay, we'll learn the three breads and we'll do it. So there's non-bread, there's the eternal bread, and there's the pranayama. So when we do non-bread, and we breathe, and we relax up, and then we let it drop. And at one point, our breath comes to the stillness. And at that point, there's a moment of eternity. And if we grab that moment of eternity, you will not get back into the state of not breathing. So your body will not give you the impulse to breathe again because it's not without breath nor with breath. Your body needs to breathe when it's without the breath. So simply don't reach that point of being without the breath when you get out of having it and stay there. So non-breath first teaches you the fear that rises from not having the breath. And as you purify this, you get used at sitting into the eternal state before you lose your eternity and then your body needs to breathe again. So you do. You just breathe again. That's cool, huh? What we want to identify is the precise fraction where there's absolutely no phenomena between two phenomena. And whatever we do, and keep this, this pram experience. Well, actually, it's not a pram experience. Pram is what supports the vacuity while not apparently into an empty moment. When there seems to be something, and you, you, you persist in the perception and experience of vacuity. So this is very high philosophy, and this is quite buzzing, and for a lot of people, they have just have no idea what I'm talking about. So it takes some work, some effort to, to work in everything you do into identifying the end of a phenomena and don't go into the beginning of the other until you tasted not a phenomenon. So if you take a sip of water, take that, we'll practice. Pram is in nature... The, the non-nature can persist. As much as in an action there can be non-action, 
There is non nature. Pram is the beach of non nature. There can be a love joy experience or a absence of phenomena into a phenomenal world. And we will take a sip, and at the end of the sip, stay. Just before you go into, I'm not drinking. Okay? So, you're not drinking right now. There's an eternity moment right before I am drinking starts to happen. Keep it while you drink. And you'll be drinking eternity. And once you're done sipping, stay in that eternity before you stop drinking. Just keep it. A pram is a new thing. Pram is not eternity. Is nature that desires to embrace non-nature is the going back but one's back into fusion one's back into nothing in other words oneness is a paradox because you are either separated or you're nothing there's no oneness oneness is something we're looking for but oneness does not exist you're either separated in components or there's nothing to be separated you call that oneness but it's not even existing so oneness is a paradox when you have oneness you actually don't have it that's why you have oneness Okay. The head cannot make it out, but the soul embraces that as, as its nectar. So we're going to do it. <coughs> if you try it both ways, drinking and then stopping, is going to be hard. So just drink, and at the end of the drinking, identify the moment where there's this eternity at the end of a drink. Without actually doing on breath you'll just breathe and you let the breath fall and find the moment where the breath ends before you're not breathing so before you go into the state of not breathing but after you're done with the letting it go there's a moment of eternity where you're eternal there a little breach where you're, you're not out of breath and you're not breathing out anymore. But you're not yet out of breath. It's just the end of that. Just do one out breath. That was an on breath. <coughs> really. When you can grasp the moment of eternity, you'll realize that your body is not fighting to take a breath because it's not in the state of not breathing. Although it's not in the state of breathing either. It's in this little breach between the two <coughs> moments, two phenomena. And you're tasting eternity, and usually your mouth will salt to water when you're not used to it. Because you, your, your body is living a new experience, okay? So now we're going to do with the sitting. Uh, the bija is pram, P-R-A-M. Pram is a mix of prema, love, and ram, joy, pleasure. Okay. Bija pram. Even though... Happiness or joy is mostly uh, suki. Joy is also ram. So pram is the bija of non-nature. It really shaking up natural structures. You know when we say that love is a flow, and p is that fe of transmit, and there's a flow there in the p. And R, Ra, R is joy, because R is radiance. So in Pram, you have the flow of love and the radiance of joy. And Am means all the energy of. Okay, so for those who study letters, it can make sense. Pram is both the love and the joy. 
So contemplate love joy. Before we do the eternity experience again, let's go back to love joy. Reawaken it. Don't force it. You don't need to, to keep it very rich. Love joy is a moment of eternity by itself. Love joy. Love joy. Pram. That's nature contemplating non-nature or absence of nature. Pram. Love joy. In that love joy, let go of the love. It is there, but it's not yours. Let go of this idea that you want to be loved. You don't, you don't need to be loved. There is love or there's not. But love is not meant to remain an action. It's meant to go into a state. Usually love is a flow. It's an action. It's a karma. And we want it to keep it as an action. It needs to keep flowing. It can breach its rules and become into a state. But in that separation, when love is flowing and then love becomes a state, there's just a little moment of eternity between the switch of phenomena. It's there. And the joy, same thing. Joy as a radiance and then joy as a state. There's a moment of eternity in love, joy, in the fusion of love and joy again. The eternity is there. Try to taste it. Pram. Love joy. Pram. Love joy. Pram. Love joy. It's a fusion. Let's turn this into a meditation. Pram. 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 The contemplation of Pram. You fall out of nature. What does it mean? <coughs> The contemplation that you are falling out of nature. Out of karma, out of events, but not yet into phenomena, not yet into state. Like if in nature there are tons of cracks, mm -hmm. tons of little spaces between matter, between time, between action, between event. Everything you've discovered with Manajava, every phenomena that are undistinct, in nature, in between every object, in between every moment of time, there are micro cracks of nothing. And you're falling out of nature, back into eternity. Pram. Pram. Love, joy. Pram. And I'll go, I gave explanations, let him go. Let him go to just make it a <clears throat> contemplation and then a meditation. Thank <laughs> you.
love, joy, nothing, eternity. Nothing is eternal. Find the state of nothing and you will be eternal. Pram, love, joy, the fusion back into bliss. Before the bliss, after the love and the joy are separated, there is this moment of eternity. It's the paradox. It's nothing specific, but it contains everything. Don't come out of meditation, contemplate the body. Softly open your eyes, contemplate the body. Between every cell of your body, there's this this infinitely small area which is not the cell anymore but not yet not the cell where every cell touched there's this little space between them and this is eternal simply contemplate that in the body you are filled with that extraordinary amount of little gaps of nature. Just, just at the end of the matter of the surface of the cell. Before it goes into the space which is not that cell. But after it is the matter that is that cell itself. There's this pellicula of eternity, of this crack in nature. That, that space between the cell is extremely small compared to the size of the cell. However, contemplate at the atomic level. The space between atoms is absolutely phenomenal and the majority of us is in eternity anyway. <laughs> at the atomic level, 
that gap in nature is absolutely immense. And nature is just one of those infinitely small points. So the more dense we are, the more gross we are by having compacted all that love to exist, the more we have something and the, the moment of nothing is extremely small, almost infinitely imperceptible. But the deeper we go and the smaller we go into the anima, into the subtle, the more that space of nothing is immense. And whatever exists is almost nothing. And that's the use of anima in this case this week. Where we'll, we'll learn to go feel that subtle, that subtlety, so that the, the amount of eternity and vacuity between two temporal nature will be, will be very easy to identify. Increase our awareness. Before we can share that eternity to the physical body, we have to be able to simply identify the reality, the, the paradoxal reality of that vacuity. That really is a phenomenon that we can be aware of. Okay, so that's the challenge this week, the first week of the boot camp. The challenge to simply acquire the skills <coughs> and the expertise to identify pram. Of course, it's a paradox. If you say pram, you're not in it. Pram is the desire to be permeable, to allow it to reveal. And when it is revealed, pram ended. So when you say pram, the bija, remember that. Exactly at the end of your pram, before the silence of Nanda Bija, but after the sound of the Bija itself, on that moment, you have one of those moments of eternity. Okay? So at the end of the Bija, Pram is the Pram that ceases to exist, which is really what it is. Right? Before that, it's your mind contemplating the possibility. So this is what we want to do. Get the intellect acquainted with the possibility of paradoxes. No mind is a paradox. But we start with that no mind to, to eventually reach non-nature. Pretty hard to do, okay? This is an introduction. To fall between the cracks of time. <laughs> Yesterday we practiced non-breath and we practiced the bija pram. We practice the sitting um, and, and the lifting to another place. As we try to identify the moment of eternity in various ways, <coughs> some of you still did not find that moment of eternity because it's extremely refined and hard to find. That doesn't mean that you fail, it means that you are normal. If you want to find a moment of eternity better or more efficiently, to ask teachers question about that experience of eternity to other people is non-productive. You should instead ask question about these existential fears that you still have and take care of the stuff that you are still facing at this moment. Because you can't really find a moment of eternity. What you do is free yourself of everything that prevents you from naturally falling into it. Okay, falling in the cracks of nature into the state of non-nature. So don't worry about it. Okay. So those who have not felt clearly the experience of eternity, do not dwell on the question what it is. Because your mind is going to try to define something undefinable that you can't understand until you've actually experienced it. Okay, so Take it easy on that topic. Rather, ask a question about the various feelings you get when you're doing your non-breath and how much you are aggressed 
with the natural impulses that come from your body. If you do some fixity, how much it hurts or not. And all the little pains that you can find here and there. Okay. Whoever found the moment of eternity, actually it's a moment of intemporality. So it's not even a moment, but we call it that way because we need words to talk. So whoever found intemporality tries to explain it and, and first dabble and uh, I don't know. I don't know. I can't explain it. There's just no way to explain it. So we'll do an exercise today to discover how we separate everything. <clears throat> Pay attention inside and relax. And as you've done a bit of fixity, non-bread, eternal bread, observation, city, sitting, You learn to calm your body and your mind, so do that. Do not go transcendental now. Just relax. Pay attention inside. Contemplate every human being. Every human being. Now contemplate every living being. With or without precision, in general, specifically, going from one to the other. The goal is to contemplate them all at the same time. Of course, you won't have refined detail on individuals. Contemplate what it means, all beings. Now, that was a trap. Observe that in this contemplation, you are not included. As we did not ask you to contemplate every other human or every other being, but all beings, and naturally you did not include it yourself. So that's egocentrism. And that is separation. You naturally will exclude yourself from the whole. So now please contemplate every living being which includes you. Now, if you learn to see the subtleties of your mind, you will perceive that you're contemplating two things right now. You're contemplating every being excluding yourself, and you're contemplating yourself excluding every other one. So you're contemplating two things, two separated ensembles. And your mind is incapable of contemplating a single whole without separation. And that is the ego's trap. It's subtle, eh? but once we find it, it's quite inspiring. So please observe that separation experience. Try to contemplate the whole, every being, as a single instance. This is the third step of that exercise. The whole, every being. And as you try to contemplate it as a single ensemble, fighting rises to keep it separate. When the Buddhas explain, we do this or that, 
for the benefit of all beings, you naturally fall into a state of sacrifice, which is separation, which is, I will not get it, any benefit from that if I'm doing it for all others. And you naturally would degrade your importance in the whole. You would discard yourself so easily, thinking that you must suffer for the benefit of all other being, which is a misunderstanding that when you are contemplating the benefit of all beings, you are benefiting. Ah, but you're so egocentric, pretending that you're trying not to be, that actually you lack self-love by discarding that you could enjoy doing something for the whole because you would be receiving from those actions. And you'd rather play the victim and use terms like sacrifice to remain separated. If there is oneness, there is oneness. And your conflict about, I have to care for myself, then you are separated. I have to care for others, then you are separated. Simply care for the whole and you will be the first one benefiting from that care because a sick doctor doesn't heal anyone and a lost guide doesn't lead anyone. Can you understand this? So this is a multiple step exercise of identifying separation, observing all beings and realize that you are excluded from that. Observing all beings, including yourself, and see that you're observing two ensembles <laughs> instead of one. And from that, try to observe a single ensemble that includes all, which forces the fight to arise and, and be aggressed from inside, that a part of you is insisting on the separation. And then you would think that to be a saint is a hard path because you're always living for others and no saint ever said that. You're living for everyone and you get to enjoy every part of the process. But you can't get there. You're fighting to remain an individual. As you sublimate separation, whatever useful part of your identity will remain. And whatever is not useful to be an individual will disappear, dissolve. So this practice is the contemplating of the whole. In a single instant of mind, there is mind there, yes. A single contemplation of the whole where you are included and not contemplated as two instances. Like a group of all beings without you and a group of you without anyone else. The goal is to get to this point of a single contemplation of unity. And as long as some aggression rises, from the conflict, you are doing efficient integration and observation. You can even do vipassana of the mind. A long, exhaustive observation of separation. So that the beliefs to benefit all beings should not benefit you or should require some kind of effort. Well, actually it does require an effort, but you're, getting, you're reaping the benefits of it. Or the belief that you must cease to enjoy the incarnate experience as you save all others. That is, that is to discard, that's the thought process to eradicate from your mind. Stuff happens. It's cool. <laughs> Get to the simplicity of oneness. So if you want to experience oneness as a being, try it in the most efficient way by recognizing the traps to try to convince you that you have it while you actually you're fighting 
And whatever is fighting, you resolve it progressively, one integration at a time. Ultimately, your physical body will still fight while your mind can contemplate oneness, your body will keep telling you the importance it is as an individual. And your regrets, your abuses, your shames, your not deserving, all these little things that made you different from the whole will rise. Progressively. Keep contemplating the whole. All beings. All beings remain individuals. Don't go into the hive mind philosophy. That's not the goal of this teaching. Contemplate all beings as individuals, but all beings, and just notice. If you are included in that, Sangaikya is the concept. And we are stretching your mind, trying to get to a point that it's naturally built to deny. <laughs> Good. This is good. So now you know what to work on. One more thing. It's very useful. 